what we learned was that it didn't matter where you were in the country, it didn't matter whether you were looking at older patients, younger patients, children, patients with or without chronic illness. The thing that predicted outcomes was patient trust and how whole person oriented care was. Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Malone, and I'm glad you're able to join us today. Before we begin, I'd like to once again welcome our friend, colleague, and program partner, Michael Giuliano. Michael is president of Plain Tree, which is a global not-for-profit organization dedicated to humanizing healthcare for everyone through excellence and person-centered care. Welcome back, Michael. Thank you, Chris, and welcome, everyone. On behalf of Fidelum Health and Plain Tree, it's fantastic to have you with us today for this additional episode of Humanizing Healthcare. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce our guest speaker for today, Dr. Dana Gelb Safran. She is internationally recognized healthcare executive, a measurement scientist, and health policy thought leader, widely credited with helping to advance our national push here in the U.S. towards value-based payment and providing the empirical basis for the drive toward patient-centered care. Dana is the president and CEO of the National Quality Forum, or NQF, and oversees their long-standing function as steward for our nation's portfolio of healthcare quality measures and leads their public-private collaborations to advance the next generation of measures required for value-based payment and healthcare equity. Previously, Dana held executive roles at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts, Haven, a joint venture with Amazon, J.P. Morgan Chase and Berkshire Hathaway, and Well Health. I could go on for much, much longer on Dana's fantastic career, but let's hand it over to her and Chris for a discussion uh, on this webinar about humanizing healthcare. Thank you, Dana, and thank you, Chris. Thank you, Michael, and welcome to the program, Dr. Safran. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael, for that generous introduction. Chris, great to see you and looking forward to this conversation. So to get us started, can you tell us um, a bit more about National Quality Forum and the role it plays in our healthcare system? Michael alluded to that a little bit, but I'm sure folks would be interested to learn a little bit more. So NQF was founded in 2000. That was uh, the time period where uh, quality measurement was really coming into its own. It was moving from uh, what I have liked to refer to as mostly an academic pursuit into real world use. And uh, the President's Commission on Consumer Protection in Healthcare um, recommended that as a, a nation, we needed uh, an entity that would oversee our portfolio of quality measures and in particular, help to ascertain which measures are good enough to be used for high stakes or accountability purposes like payment, public reporting, performance-based network designs. And NQF was founded for that purpose. Over two decades time, NQF really has become a trusted brand for convening all the stakeholder segments across the healthcare ecosystem to grapple with the hardest challenges in, in healthcare and, and in quality measurement. Uh, and our portfolio of work today really focuses on the work that I like to describe as upstream and downstream from our nation's portfolio of measures. So not so much overseeing the portfolio of measures itself, but rather confronting the pain points that every stakeholder names with respect to the field of quality measurement today. There's too many measures. We're not measuring the right things. The burden is too high. We don't have the right data sources. The data isn't enough real time. And then the downstream uh, challenges of how do you take measures and deploy them in ways that actually make care better, uh, more affordable, more equitable uh, without adding undue burden. So that's the focus of our of NQF's work now. And uh, we are tremendously excited and energized by the initiatives that are underway. Terrific. Now, as I listen to Michael's kind of preview or, or short summary of your career, I'm really struck by, gosh, that's an amazing journey you've been on. But I'm wondering, where did it all start? Is there a story you can share about how you chose a, a career in healthcare? I had been through one round of, of graduate school, had a master's degree in public health, was working in the field of, of research. I knew that I really loved the intersection of data and policymaking. Uh, I had figured that out when I was in college. My post-college job was in that space. Uh, my graduate training first time through was in that space. And I was working in research uh, on healthcare, health policy related issues. Um, and, and really came to recognize that, 
you know, I, I wanted that deeper understanding that would allow me to actually conduct healthcare, uh, health services research um, as a principal investigator. I spent a, a good uh, first half of my 30 years in, in the quality measurement field as a measure developer. And, um, and so I had this moment where I said, you know, I need to go back and uh, get a doctoral degree. And it was really at that moment that I shifted the focus of my work from what had been less about health care, more about environmental health, uh, occupational health, to health care delivery. Uh, and that happened largely because I had the incredible good fortune to be offered a fellowship working on the medical outcome study. The medical outcome study, uh, some of our listeners may know, others may not, but it was the child of the RAND health insurance experiment. Many, if not most, will know the RAND uh, HIE. That was a randomized study that helped us learn much of what we know today about how cost sharing uh, changes affect patient behavior. The medical outcome study, the child of, of the RAND HIE, was an observational study that used entirely patient reported information to understand across um, eight years of time uh, the impacts of different healthcare settings and different medical specialties and different care processes on patient experiences of care and patient health outcomes. And that was really where I cut my teeth and learned what I learned about measurement science, got tremendously excited about it, and have never looked back. Wow, that's remarkable. Now, I know in some of your you know, earlier research, you did a, a lot of focus on the uh, importance of the quality of clinical relationships. Can you tell us more about that work and the importance of provider relationships for patients? Oh, yeah. So that's how I came to be so passionate, really, uh, Chris, about the work you're doing at Fidelum, about the work that Plain Tree does, uh, is, yeah. So in, in the earliest years of my uh, career after getting my doctorate, in fact, part of my doctorate was developing um, a set of measures that would go deep into the patient experience, specifically on the quality of clinical relationships. And what I was focused on uh, in the early years there was how do we operationalize the definition of primary care that says that those relationships need to be whole person oriented. Um, but at the time, patient experience measurement, which was at the time still being called patient satisfaction measurement, um, was really looking at the more, um, I'd say, process or um, superficial aspects of care. And I was interested in how within primary care, the quality of clinical relationships could be measured. And if we could measure it, what would we learn about how the quality of those relationships affected outcomes of care? And so uh, my very first uh, uh, federal grant was a grant to develop a measure set. Uh, it was called the Primary Care Assessment Survey that had um, a, a large number of measures, all patient reported on care experiences but most of them looking in a very granular way at the quality of the clinical relationship. So we looked at patient trust in their primary care physician. We looked at um, how whole person oriented patients felt their care was, uh, quality of communication, quality of interpersonal treatment, as well as some of the more structural or process aspects of care, access um, and integration of care, um, continuity of care. Um, and that kind of gave us a, a fingerprint, let's call it, of, of differences in primary care settings and allowed us to begin to look at the relationship between both the structural and relational aspects of primary care performance and how do those seem to be uh, related to outcomes. And then over a decade's time, what we learned was that very, very consistently, it didn't matter where you were in the country, it didn't matter whether you were looking at older patients, younger patients, children, um, patients with or without chronic illness, consistently, the thing that predicted outcomes was patient trust and how whole person oriented care was. Those two measures over and over again. And they predicted both health outcomes, including adherence to clinical advice, improved symptomatology, and 
and actual clinical outcomes as well as business outcomes. Like, does the patient stay with this clinical practice, um, malpractice uh, suits, and and those kind of business outcomes? For both business and health outcomes, we saw that the quality of the clinical relationship, and in particular trust and a whole person orientation to care, were the leading uh, predictors of outcomes. Wow. Wow. And that's 20 years ago. Now, if we think about 20 years later and how our healthcare system has evolved with the introduction of you know, larger health systems, virtual care, digital communication, online portals, all of that... Yeah. What do you think all of that, the impact of that has been on those relationships between providers and patients? Has the technology been helping or has it in some ways, you know, diminished those relationships? Well, it's a very good question. And, you know, it's a, an empirical question. If we if we actually were tracking those things, we would know the answer. So what I can give you isn't an empirical answer. I don't have the data on that. But what I can say based on, you know, when we were studying um, before the days of of virtual visits and so forth, we were studying um, the impact of visit-related continuity and uses of teams in care. And what we saw very clearly, um, both in cross-sectional data, but also in longitudinal data, where we actually made a change and looked to see, did that change the patient experience, was continuity of the clinical relationship mattered, right? And there was, and that wasn't a given. At the time, there were health systems that were set up with a point of view that said, it doesn't matter which clinician walks in the room, the electronic health record or the medical record uh, preceding it is the source of continuity. And as long as you have that, you can create continuity and, and relationships. And our data showed otherwise, and in fact showed in one um, clinical practice that that I worked with as an advisor, after the Institute of Medicine published the Crossing the Quality Chasm Report, and that named patient-centered care as one of the pillars of a high-performing health system, suddenly, you know, health systems across the country were saying, you know, putting in their mission statement, we're patient-centered, and then saying, what does that actually mean? How do we know if we actually are? So I was having a tremendously different set of experiences now putting our measures to use, working with practices to see where they are and help them improve. And one of the things we did in in this large uh, multi-specialty system in Massachusetts was to say, look, your rates of visit-related continuity are very low. Mm -hmm. And so we hypothesized that if we can just do two things, increase visit-based continuity and increase what we were calling um, visible team care, meaning if the patient is not seeing the clinician they think of as their primary clinician, have the other person explain how they relate to that person and how that person is going to be kept informed about the fact that I saw you today. The CMO of the organization at the time said it's team care as opposed to mob care. Um, which I thought was a good way to articulate it, really reflected the patient experience of otherwise it's it's an invisible team. It's just this mob of people who walk in the room and you don't know how they relate to each other. Well, so what we showed was simply by changing those things, doing nothing with individual clinician communication skills, behaviors, nothing around those things, just by increasing visit-related continuity and a visible team approach to care. Um, increased all the relational measures of care. It increased the quality of communication that patients reported. It increased interpersonal uh, treatment scores. It increased that whole person orientation and trust, which then increased outcomes and and retention of patients. So uh, I, to me, those are the best data I know of to tell us we can hypothesize that our approaches to care today if we aren't prioritizing creating that continuity, no matter which mode we're interacting with the patient. But if we're sort of taking that approach, it doesn't matter who sees the patient as long as they have the record. I think we're we're going to see some, some negative fallout from that in terms of patient loyalty and patient outcomes. Yeah. 
Yeah, it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. Now, it's also interesting that, you know, from that foundational time, you know, looking at relationships and the impact on quality, you also spent time at Blue Cross Blue Shield as an architect of value-based payment models. And I'm wondering, you know, where does patient experience and clinician relationships and all of that fit in to the success of value-based care? I think it's absolutely a backbone of successful value-based care. And here's why. Value-based care um, asks provider organizations to be accountable for both the total cost of care and the quality of care. And that quality of care includes, you know, the processes and, and sort of the clinical effectiveness of care. It includes outcomes and it includes a patient experience. Um, and so in designing the alternative quality contract, the measure set that we assembled in 2007 was by far the broadest measure set, you know, at the time. At the time, paying for performance was a brand new concept. Typically, it was one or two or three measures, very little money attached. The, every provider got to pick and, you know, everything was different. This was, you know, there is a measure set. Everyone who comes into this contract is held accountable for the same measures, has the same performance targets. Um, and the measures cover ambulatory and hospital care within those spaces. They include process outcome and patient experience measures. And the reason that I say that patient experience measures are such a critical backbone um, is that one of the biggest concerns our public has about models that create accountability for total cost of care is the risk of having um, providers stinting on care, right? If I now have an incentive where I get shared savings for um, providing less care, then I'm afraid you're going to, you know, at the extreme, put up a gone fishing sign and, you know, collect your shared savings from providing no care to me. You can't do that and perform well on a patient experience and also on patient outcomes. You just can't, right? Um, if what we're measuring from patients, and it was what we were measuring in, in the AQC, at, at, in the patient experience segment of our measure set is access and communication quality and a whole person orientation to care. Um, you actually have to attend to those things and perform well on those things at the same time that you're trying to be a careful steward of resources and not overspend uh, population-based budgets. Yeah. Well, you know, on the one hand, it's been really surprising to me, but on the other hand, it makes perfect sense, right? And outside of healthcare, we're such a social species as humans that so much of our behavior is driven by those relationships. And so we always believed that that would be the case in healthcare as well, but we never expected there would be such a stark impact on the clinical outcomes. We thought people have better relationships, they'd be more loyal, but it turns out that those relationships are what keep, keep people showing up for their wellness visits and staying on their medication and getting diagnosed with conditions at early stages rather than late stages. And so it's just really stark how strong the impact is on not only the kind of emotional side of things, but on the physical side as well. Yeah. And, and just to, to double down on what you've just said, Chris, you know, as we really confront the issues of health equity and how we um, make true, sincere, significant progress against the disparities that have been so long standing, both in process, but more importantly, in outcomes, in the health of our population, we cannot do that if we aren't attending to the fact that you have populations who come into the system, do not feel understood, do not feel listened to, feel dismissed. Um, and so having the clinician skill sets and diversity in backgrounds and, and race, ethnicity, language, all the other aspects that go into creating a trusting relationship um, is absolutely critical. And it's not a one size fits all. You know, you have to be able to build that relationship one patient at a time. No, I, you're absolutely right. And there's nothing that's more evidence that you have a relationship than that someone knows who you are, they remember what matters to you, and they personalize that experience. It's no different than the clinical diagnosis, right? We Not every patient shows up with the same clinical needs. You know, we can't take the same uh, one size fits all approach on the emotional relationship side either. Yeah. 
That's right. So what about the clinician side of things? You know, in your experience, to what extent do those relationships with patients matter to clinicians? Do they have an impact on their engagement and retention and well-being? I would say a definitive yes. Uh, but it's another area where I wish that I had the empirical data that was behind that. Yes, um, it's it's much more uh, qualitative uh, information that we have. We know that right now the medical profession and the healthcare profession more broadly, not just physicians, nurses, social workers, pharmacists, are in distress, and there are a lot of reasons for that. And quite honestly, I'm not. Um, not naive to the fact that quality measurement is blamed for a lot of that distress. I think a lot of the distress really is that it's hard to think of a clinician that any of us knows or interacts with through our, our work or our personal lives that didn't go into the profession wanting deeply at their core to be of service to people, to help people. And to be moved by that experience of taking care of a human being and to to know you know what how profound that is and so the fact that the profession is changing in ways that have clinicians feeling that that is less and less a part of what their day-to-day -day experiences and job is is i think at the core of the dissatisfaction and you know heartbreaking rates of mental health crisis um, and early retirements and, and the other uh, real signs and, and uh, red flags that we have that this is a profession that's in crisis right now. Yeah, I think that's really the, at the heart of the challenge is finding the balance between all of the the quality kind of control and measurement things we need to do while also still allowing time for patients and clinicians to connect emotionally with one another, right? The degree to which we are under pressure for efficiency or productivity or medical records documentation or what have you tends to make things feel transactional for both the patient and the care provider. And they both lose from that because the care provider doesn't get the emotional fuel that brought them to healthcare in the first place. Yeah, I think that's right. Let's turn back to um, National Quality Forum. What are some of the top priorities for NQF, you know, this year and for the next couple of years? Yeah, well, uh, thanks for the question. And, you know, I, I uh, pointed to this a little bit in my opening by saying that, that the work that NQF is focused on now is what I describe as um, the work that lives upstream and downstream from our nation's portfolio of quality measures. So what do I mean by upstream? I mean the measures we need that we don't have, the data infrastructure for measurement improvement we need that we don't have, and then downstream means, you know, how do we actually take the measures we have and deploy them in ways that make care better, safer, more affordable, more equitable. So in I'll say a little bit about both those spaces. So in the upstream space, we're doing a number of things that I think are just hugely exciting and go right at the problems that we know exist and are the key pain points for every stakeholder. I think you'd be hard pressed to find anyone, anyone who's a medical professional in a, in working in a healthcare organization, working in a payer organization, a patient, a purchaser, hard pressed to find anyone who thinks that we're doing well with quality measurement today, right? And the concerns, we know them. They are, there are too many measures. They're too burdensome. We're not using the right data sources. Uh, it takes too long and costs too much to develop new measures. Um, and the measures are competing. There's this cacophony of measures. Every payer is using a different variant on, on things that purportedly measure the same thing. Those are the things upstream that NQF is working on now. And we're so excited to be doing so. Uh, one of our, our signature initiatives in that space we call Aligned Innovation. And Aligned Innovation is specifically designed to accelerate progress toward a next generation of measures that fill high priority gaps in our nation's portfolio of measures that reflect the outcomes that patients and clinicians say matter most and that are developed in the space of two years instead of six or more years, as typically occurs in, in the field. And in addition to that, we, through uh, the practice of prospective alignment, meaning before we even get started, we get payers and purchasers to agree, 
what are those highest priority gaps that we need for our value-based payment programs, for our center of excellence models, for transparency tools? What's missing that we need? And let's agree we will collectively work to develop those measures and then we will use them so that and we will retire two measures for every one that we add. And so it goes right at that sort of cacophony and the burden. Um, and and at, you know, we need to be measuring the right thing. So we've gotten started. Our first cycle of aligned innovation is working on the priorities that were set for new behavioral health outcome measures, specifically addressing depression and anxiety outcomes for children, adolescents, and adults, and maternal health outcome measures, specifically addressing how we reduce the risk of severe maternal morbidity and postpartum death. And by doing so, improve the health equity, uh, which is such a um, dramatic and persistent and unconscionable problem that we have in our healthcare system. Um, and uh, so, so that's the work that that NQF is is doing upstream. In addition, I mentioned, you know, what are the data sources we need? Um, we're doing some really exciting work around the use of the electronic health record in novel ways that will reduce burden while increasing the value of the clinical information. We have a team working on um, measures of diagnostic excellence um, and quality of diagnosis, timeliness of diagnosis has heretofore eluded quality measurement in large part because you need the whole longitudinal view of the patient. Who knew what and when and, and where was it known in order to understand you know, the accuracy and timeliness of a diagnosis? And one of the things that I think is really exciting is the role that AI methods like natural mm -hmm. language processing mm -hmm. can play in using the clinical narrative to, um, to be able to assess the, the um, diagnostic quality and timeliness. And if you think about how that could then generalize to other ways of using those methods for quality measurement, it's a win-win because it gives us richer clinical information without adding burden, right? It doesn't change workflows. You still enter the clinical narrative into a patient's record. We're not asking for new structured and standardized fields. So I, there's some very exciting work we're involved in there. And then just to take another moment on the downstream work, you know, how you deploy those measures. Um, there's a lot that we're doing in that space, but um, probably most exciting uh, for your audience to know is that last August, we announced a new uh, affiliation with the Joint Commission. Um, and that strategic affiliation really allows us to use the Joint Commission as a very important effector arm for the work that we're doing upstream, right? To feed those next-gen measures and to help rationalize existing measure sets in uh, how Joint Commission uses measures for accreditation and its certification of excellence programs. So a lot that uh, is on our agenda now, and it's all pointed squarely at trying to really have quality measurement live up to its potential and um, stop being a source of of pain and start being a source of, of real value. Uh, for Those are, are four really big issues. I mean, the, the behavioral health crisis, particularly among younger people, the inequity and the morbidity of, of women, uh, pregnant women, particularly in the United States relative to other parts of the world, the burden of medical health record you know, documentation. And yeah. that's, I think, the definition of real innovation when we can use technology to lighten the burden on humans so they can spend more yeah. time connecting rather than serving the technology. Essentially. Yes. Yes. And so, you know, given all of this and, and the things that you're working on, how would you kind of characterize the current state of where we are in patient experience measurement and where do you see kind of the growth and innovation coming in the future? Yeah. Well, um, you know, I think that on the one hand, um, part of what is so exciting to me is that the field of patient experience measurement um, is now absolutely firmly placed at the table and accepted as a core part of what we have to have in our quality measure sets. That was not predictable in the 1990s when I and others were working on a new generation of patient experience measures, trying to transition the language as well as the measurement methods from satisfaction measurement to 
real measurement of the care experience and showing that that affects outcomes, right? It was not necessarily predictable that that set of measures would find their place of legitimacy at the table. And they have, and that's absolutely fantastic. And I think the, you know, the CAPS initiative uh, has really helped to bring science and and a robustness to that area of measurement. Um, you know, we wouldn't be where we are today with C-suite executives worrying about their patient experience if it weren't for HCAPS and other uh, CAPS surveys, in my view. Mm -hmm. um, that said, we understand, and I think the CAPS team also understands, I know ARC very well understands, that there is a great deal of dissatisfaction now with the field of patient experience measurement and a real sense of urgency that we have to move to um, the next way of measuring patient experience and the next um, level of depth of what it is that we're measuring and how we're measuring it, right? And uh, I think there's enormous appetite for that. We've seen that in our uh, Aligned Innovation Coalition. Uh, that was really one of the things that that group wanted to prioritize. We ultimately, as you heard, decided to focus on behavioral health and maternal health. But the their, they felt a sense of urgency that they need better, um, more relevant patient experience measures. And so I, we do have to get there. And I, I think ARC is looking at that very seriously. And, and uh, I know that, that that has the attention of the CAPS team as well. But there's other innovators, you know, out in the in the um, ecosystem who are beginning to to look at this. And 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 um, that's good. We need we need innovation in this space. Great. Great. And so given all of this, what advice would you offer to healthcare quality and patient experience leaders that are wanting to make, meaning, make meaningful progress in kind of building relationships with patients and improving their clinical outcomes? Are there things, any kind of, you know, top three or rules of thumb or areas yeah. to start that you would, you know, uh, recommend given all that you've seen, you know, over the past 20 years? Yeah, I love that question, Chris. Um, I guess what I would say, I, I'd sort of point back to something we talked about a little while ago, which is we've got the evidence relationships matter and relationships meaning like human to human, and that gets created through continuity. Um, and so I think that we have to be paying attention to that in how we design our delivery models. And that that whole concept as well of visible team care that, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, one individual has to always be the one interacting with patients, but we have to really keep in mind the patient experience and understand that for a patient to leave an interaction with a healthcare provider motivated and equipped to do what was asked of them outside of the four walls or outside of the virtual visit to do what is needed to prevent the onset of a condition or manage a condition, they have to have trust that that person is clinically expert, but also knows and understands me, has asked the questions that let them know that this plan is actually going to be feasible for me, that I understand it and I'm motivated to execute it, right? You can do that without the same person always interacting with the patient, but you can't do it, I would argue, without paying attention to establishing a relationship with the individual. And when it's a team-based care model, having that patient understand how you relate to the clinician they know best. That's right. And that you are a partner and that that clinician will know that you were seen today, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that that human experience matters. And, you know, sometimes healthcare safety gets compared to airline industry, but the difference there is, you know, the individual passenger has absolutely no impact on the whether that plane is going to take off and land safely. But whether you'll have a good outcome, a good health outcome for patients depends enormously on, on the individual patient. And that means the clinician connecting with that patient, educating them, understanding them, motivating them, making sure they're uh, really equipped um, to, to do what they need to do is, is really essential. 
Yeah, no question about it. I do have one more question for you, which is my favorite final question, is do you have a favorite quote uh, and you could share with us? And if so, why is your favorite quote? Oh, I guess the quote I love the most is be the change you want to see in the world. And it is attributed to Gandhi. I think I once heard that it wasn't, did, it didn't originate with Gandhi, but um, but I I don't have that at my fingertips. So I'm going to attribute it to Gandhi. But I, I do believe that. And I think I live by that is uh, be the change you want to see in the world. And I think you have certainly made a lot of change in this world. And I can't thank you enough for the impact that you've had over your career in improving not only the measurement, the quality of, of patient outcomes and the relationships and the whole patient experience space that we are all working in now. So ma- many kudos to you for being the change that you wanted to be. Thank you so much, Chris. I really yeah. appreciate that. So I really want to thank you for sharing your perspective and expertise with us today. The National Quality Forum is a leading voice in making healthcare more person-centered for all. And we look forward to looking uh, at your progress and the key initiatives that you highlighted already. Um, For our listeners today, thank you for joining us as well. We hope you found this discussion as informative and inspiring as I did. As I mentioned, we'll be posting a recording of today's program on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube, and everyone who registered will receive a link to the recording in which I will include Dana's references. Be sure to join us next month. We'll have another humanizing healthcare discussion. We'll be talking with another healthcare leader and innovator that we'll announce soon. And in the meantime, have a terrific rest of your week, and thanks very much.